Well, I guess I'm up first. So I'll, I'll spare you the pain of me introducing myself. I will say that I'm John West, uh, the director of the HPC Modernization Program. I took over for Craig Henry once, once he moved on to bigger and better things. Um, I talked to Charlie Holland, who is now at DARPA, but at the time appointed Craig Henry, and he said, when I gave him the job, I didn't realize I was appointing a dictator for life. So uh, Craig did serve for about 12 years, and uh, he's not completely gone, but he is missed. Uh, so I'm up first this morning, and I'm going to talk about what's missing from HPC. There's a lot of conversation, even at the White House level, but certainly throughout our community, uh, about how do we extend the reach of our technologies to non-traditional users. Um, and that's either new technology areas that are coming on uh, that we're just beginning to apply to whatever mission your particular agency or service has, uh, or things that we've been doing for a long time that we just haven't been using high-performance computing for. Some folks call this the missing middle. Some folks call this, uh, my, my friend Mark calls this the next 5,000 to contrast it with the top 500, which I think is a fairly evocative way to refer to it. Um, but no matter the label that you get it, if you're in this room, if you probably think HPC is a pretty good idea, right? So I, I want us to think a little bit about that um, for a second. It's not just those of us who do this for a living, uh, in my case, only about 25 years, some of you much longer. Bill Fireisen, sorry, sorry, Bill. <laughs> Uh, it's not just us that are talking about it. Um, you can go out and Google and get 25 or 30 reports just on the first two pages for folks that think HPC is a great idea, and it is. A lot of case studies coming out of the Council on Competitiveness about it, the role that uh, modeling and simulation and high-performance computing-enabled modeling and simulation can play in transforming the bottom line for businesses. And of course, the big science agencies and uh, nation states have known about the power of HPC for a long time. We'll talk about that over the next few days. We have a great program that focuses on what's going on at supercomputing internationally. Uh, and if you look, if you go back to the first top 500 list in 92 or 93 and you put all those countries on a map, and then you go to the last list and put all those countries on a map, it's really remarkable to see the change and the growth. Um, very few countries have dropped off and a lot more countries have come on. Uh, and of course, the top 500 only tracks the, the apex of the investment. If you look at the next 5,000, um, the list is even more astonishing. So significant investment in, in high performance computing and in supercomputing across the world, getting attention uh, from leaders of not just this country, uh, but countries around the world. So if you look really deep, I think, about your feelings about supercomputing, it's sort of obvious to you that supercomputing is a good idea, right? And in fact, I would submit that, so I'm an Apple guy, I've got an iPad, I like it, I recognize that it has limitations, right? Uh, it's, it's terrible, for example, for cooking food if you're camping. Right? It doesn't do everything all the time. Um, and I could admit that, right? My mom probably doesn't need an iPad, and if she had one, she couldn't make good use of it. But HPC people tend to act a little bit differently about supercomputing, right? Without realizing it, a lot of times, we tend to act like supercomputing is as good an idea as the sun, right? It applies everywhere all the time. <laughs> and it's sort of without question that it's an unalloyed good. Um, I think that's, that's not always helpful, and we'll talk a little bit about why in, in just a minute. So this is the A technical computing pyramid. Uh, there are a million of these going back at least to Branscombe and, and probably predating him as well. This is, this is one way to break it up. Um, Supercomputing at the very top, individual computing at the bottom, and, and that's still technical computing. I'm only talking about technical computing here. But there I'm talking about MATLAB and engineering analysis tools and moms and pops and little individual um, research outfits that are on top of a desk or under a desk or these days in a lab, right? You can actually do quite a bit of really useful work on your laptop these days. And that counts. It counts as technical computing. It's good and valid. And if you can run successfully, I need to make sure that you actually mean that and know what you're saying, but if you can run successfully on your laptop and accomplish your mission, please stay there. 
because I have way more users than I can accommodate on my supercomputers, right? Um, at the same time, I bet if you push a little bit on your requirements, you, you'll see that you won't always be able to stay on your laptop. In the middle, we've got this group that I, that I tend to refer to as high performance computing. So some people use HPC and supercomputing as being synonymous. I like to divide them. Supercomputing is the very top. High performance computing is the next stuff, right? So closet clusters, even small one to five, six rack systems. If you look at, this may not be true in every community, but I think it's, it's true on average across the supercomputing community. If you look at where the users are, right? There's certainly a lot in the individual computing category, right? Um, and if you extend that out to everybody that has a personal computer, it's, it's hundreds of millions of folks. At the very top, uh, it's a few users, right? My program has five to 6,000 users. Uh, other large federal programs are probably on the same order of magnitude, so it's tens of thousands probably. Maybe, maybe it gets to 100,000 actual users if you count the entire global population. Uh, in a pool of billions of people, that's not a very large number of people. And even in the smaller pool of people that care about technical computing, it's not a very large group of people. But the part that's a little bit worrisome is the fact that in the middle, on average, there are relatively few users, right? It makes sense that there would actually be a continuum. Folks would start on their individual, their workstation, maybe their, their work group uh, cluster, a couple of nodes that they share. Uh, as they got better at what they do, as other people wanted to pay them more for what it is that they do, as their analyses got more complex, you would expect them to step up and start using the small supercomputers. And then eventually some small set of them might go up to the big iron. Not everybody needs to be on the big iron. Uh, we can't afford to have everybody on the big iron. But you would expect there to be more of a continuum than we actually see today. And if you run a supercomputing center or you're involved in your organization's technical computing, you probably have anecdotal evidence that's similar, right? Now this isn't true in every industry. Some industries are doing a better job than other industries. Um, bio is a good example of where there actually is more of a continuum. Um, but traditional engineering, and certainly within the Department of Defense in engineering and, and weapons design, which is where you would expect a lot of of uh, uh, technical computing to be used and there to be a complete and well-populated continuum, there is not. There's a hole in the middle, uh, the missing middle. All right, so where are they? Especially given that we're offering a technology that's as good as the sun, right? Where are they? Why, why, uh, why isn't there a continuum? Well, let's think a little bit about how we got the users that we have today in our community. Um, and I just picked a few things that people do with supercomputers. There are lots and lots and lots. Um, and, uh, and they're all really interesting. You'll hear about many of them this week. If you are a researcher who uh, is interested in how galaxies collide, you pretty much don't have a choice. You need a supercomputer. Right? The equations are hairy and they're complex. And you can do a little bit on a, on a sheet of paper. And you can do a little bit more on a legal pad. And then that's about it. Right? There aren't any beakers. And there's no test harnesses that I know of. Uh, no laboratories to let you study how galaxies collide. So you've got to have a supercomputer if you're going to make any progress, unless you get lucky and happen to see one with a telescope, right? So no choice. Uh, this is not a real explosion. This is actually from a movie, but it looked pretty good. Uh, all, all, the, all the photographs of real buildings being blown up are a little controversial. So uh, if you're interested in, in blowing stuff up, or interested in ensuring that things don't fall down when someone tries to blow them up, so there's a peacetime and a wartime use for that technology. The only practical way for you to make progress in your field is to use a supercomputer. Right? If you have a little bit of money, you can go out and build one or two buildings every 10 years and blow them up and watch them fall down. But it's not practical, probably, unless you have infinite time and infinite res uh, fiscal resources for you to do that on a routine basis. Right? So people that are interested in this kind of effect and this kind of engineering design didn't have a choice. They needed a supercomputer. Here's another example where computing came along early, actually. <coughs> So if you design aircraft, right, uh, then you know about wind tunnels. This is, this is an example of one of the world's largest wind tunnels. 
And to give you an idea of the scale, you, you can look at the, the power towers there to the left and the, the tiny little cars in the parking lot and the other seemingly tiny buildings around it, which aren't really tiny at all. They're normal size. This is an enormous facility costing hundreds of millions of dollars to build. Right? But if you have something that's near full scale that you need to test, as for example, if you're doing a radical aircraft design that's going to carry people and uh, you want to be sure that one or more of them don't die the first time you fly it, you would be interested in testing before you lit up the engines, right? Well, the only way to do that testing was in a, in a physical way, in a wind tunnel, right? You, so even nation states can't afford to build more than a few of these. So you, once you've built your few of these, right, from then on, the pace of innovation is going to be gated. So if you want to make faster progress in your field, and I would argue if you want to make significant progress in your field, you need supercomputing. So most of the HPC and supercomputing users that we have today, we got because they didn't have a choice. They didn't have anywhere else to go. And the tools that we offered them were not great, and they're still not great. Um, this interface is, is from, I'm going to guess, the early 80s. Right? And if you are still a supercomputing user in this room, you know that the interface that you use isn't green anymore, but it looks a lot like that. Okay, keyboard's a little bit better, the monitor's a little snappier, but you're still using a command line. In an era where none of the scientists and engineers entering the workplace have ever seen an audio tape, right? let alone used a command line interface in any of their training. By the time they come to you guys looking for work, or by the time they've done something useful and you want to employ them, They've spent their whole lives on, on, with a different interface, a different set of tools, right, than we provide in HPC. So the whole computing, computing community has moved along to create these relatively rich, not great, but relatively rich interfaces that provide a lot of cognitive support. Uh, and in supercomputing, we're still doing this. Why? Because our users are willing to accept it. They don't have a choice. Right? I'm actually not going to talk about the interface. Um, which is what I usually talk about when I show a slide like this. Uh, but it's part, of the, uh, it's part of the reason that we have a missing middle. Down at the bottom of the pyramid, so we've been talking about how we got our supercomputing users. Down at the bottom of the pyramid down there were those individual computing users. Uh, the choice for them was obvious, right? They could either rub three sticks together that had marks on it, or they could use a computer. And uh, it seemed pretty obvious that, that using a computer was better than a slide rule. Um, and even today, uh, although I, I work in an engineering organization that's about 100 years old, I don't see a lot of slide rules, right? So the, 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 the move of the individual computer into the workspace happened pretty naturally. Right. But what about the middle? Right. They stayed at the bottom. Even though we offer this really great technology, right? I mean, all, surely all we have to do is show it to them. Right? Just look up. It's an unalloyed good, right? Why aren't you guys doing this? So a little facetious, but I, even I've, I've caught myself, and I'm a little bit self-aware about this fault, but not completely, talking to folks who aren't using computational tools who, who, or who aren't using something above an individual resource when they clearly need it, right? And they're spending two months to get one uh, parameter study done when, when they really need to be spending two weeks to get 10,000 parameter studies done to make a really good X, a really good uh, washing machine box, a really good potato chip, a really good diaper, a really good drug, a really good missile, right? You need that richness of study and exploration that you get from having resources uh, that, that can turn around a complex job quickly, right? So even when, I, even when I talk to these folks, right, I catch myself a lot of times thinking, falling into the trap that all I have to do is show them that they can run on a thousand processors and finish in a day rather than a week, and that should be good enough. It's just self-evident, right? But the evidence is to the contrary. Clearly, it isn't self-evident. We do have a missing middle, and so it's important to look at why. This is one way to talk about the journey from the bottom of the pyramid to the top, okay? It's steep. And this picture is a little dark, but most of the people in the picture are at the bottom and they're all looking at the one challenged person who's trying to climb to the top. Um, and I think that this is, as I interact with individual work groups who are considering this move, this is 
emotionally where they're at, right? So when you move from individual computing user to an HPC user, you've got a lot of challenges that you have to overcome. And I'm not going to talk about most of these, but I am going to enumerate them. So you've got expensive hardware and software at the bottom. I put it at the bottom because thanks to Intel and the explosive growth of personal electronics, we're mostly over this one. It's not so expensive anymore. Although, if you're talking about small manufacturers or small businesses of any kind, $50,000 is still real money. And, and we can forget that. It is still relatively complex to manage these things, particularly if you have an IT group who is used to doing Windows PCs and that's all they do or all they want to do right? or all they're funded to do. And adding the management piece in makes the buy decision more complex. So if, if all, you, all you want to bring in is a 250 core workstation, right, or 250 core little cluster, um, you, first you have to come up with the money and that's your first challenge and then you have to convince the guys in charge of IT that they need, this is a skill set that they need to develop to support your one machine, right, in the face of their hundreds or thousands of machines that are all alike, you want to bring in one that's a, a little bit different. And that may not be okay. Uh, we do have primitive, primitive interfaces and that is still a problem. Uh, farther up the, the chain of obstacles, and this is the one that we don't spend a lot of time talking about, is that there's little expertise and almost no social support. And here I'm talking about for the case where you're bringing uh, high-end or mid-range supercomputing into a domain that hasn't had it before. Right? The guy that wants to do that or the lady that wants to do that has, has the problem that none of her friends does it. Right? None of her colleagues does it. There's no one that she can walk down the hall and say, hey, this doesn't work. And she says, oh, well, you know, if you check the on switch. <laughs> There's not that network of social support that lubricates that kind of transition and makes it a little bit easier. If, if you want to pick up a Mac in your workplace, you're probably these days not the first person to use a Mac. So you can go talk to Joe, who's had one for five or six years, and say, hey, I'm thinking about this. And he says, oh, yeah, it's great. You, you need to watch out for this and this. But if you're talking about a workplace that's new to high performance computing, that support network isn't there. And that is a significant barrier, right? <coughs> Excuse me. And then there's, in many application areas, <coughs> an incomplete tool chain. And in fact, I would argue that the tool chain is incomplete for most of the users of supercomputing today. And when I say tool chain here, I'm talking about the individual applications that you need to use computing at all the places in the technical workflow where it might apply. Right. So even today, the tool chain is incomplete at the high end, and Doug Post will talk about some of his experiences with this in the Department of Defense when he talks about the CREATE program a little bit later uh, in the conference. Right. But this is an even, even bigger problem if you're farther down, let's say you're a second or ter third tier uh, part of some supply chain somewhere, and you're your job is to go in and, and, and uh, injection mold some little part, right? Well, the non-technical way to do that is to get a guy who's been doing this for 20 years and design a mold and do the injection and then it'll probably work, but he knows just the right way to tweak it and flex it when it, come, when it pops out of the mold to see if he actually did the job right. right. And if it breaks, then he knows probably the next thing he needs to try, right? Well, getting that knowledge into an application and then getting that application into a form that it can be used by a person that needs to use it right, to perform their job is a non-trivial task. And Doug has spent five to six years doing this for the Department of Defense Acquisition Community and, and uh, he, he and his team will spend another 10 years getting the job done. It's difficult. Okay, so why did the missing middle stay at the bottom? They have something that works today, right? They have something that works. It might be painful, it might be non-optimal, uh, it might be slowing the pace of innovation, uh, it might always be late and over budget, but it works. And they know that if they turn the crank, they're gonna get an answer. And, and part of the reason that this matters is that the group of people that we're talking about, when, when we think about the missing middle of the next 5,000, um, have a choice, right? And they have, for the most part, or in many cases, they have real penalties for non-performance. 
So if you're a, a small to medium sized business and you don't make your deadline, you lose real money. And if you've only got 100 to a couple hundred employees, you know, losing real money might mean having to fire real people. Right? So there's a big risk here. Even if you're a much larger program, uh, in the defense community, for example, um, weapons development program and, and equipment procurement programs are huge. Right? There's a lot of pressure to get those things done and an excursion to see if high performance computing might work for me and my workflow is pretty high risk because the stakes for failure are so high. Right? And then the other reason the missing middle take stay where they were or stay where they are is it's too hard to try it out. Right? For the reasons that we just talked about, the barriers to entry are too high. So what can we do? What can we, what can we do to get these guys to look up and see the, the, uh, the sunlight of our fantastic technology? Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more, um, just a few slides on, on each of the individual areas and then I'll focus on development, right? Expensive hardware and software, as I mentioned, we're pretty much over this these days. Um, Cray One in 1976, 80 megaflops for almost $9 million. An iPad 2 last year, 170 megaflops for 500. Now the usability of those flops is a little different. I'll give you that, but the message is the same. Complex management, I'm not a cloud cheerleader, right? So you're not gonna get that from me, although I, I, but I do think the technology has promise. It does apply even in our community in some cases. It has potential. It's not a panacea as, as most panaceas are. It's actually fairly limited in what it can do, but when it's, when it's appropriate, it's, it's appropriate and it hits a home run. So cloud technologies and STAR as a service right, offer a lot of promise to address the complex management issues, particularly for people who are trying to start that transition, move up from the individual computing level into high performance computing. It can be a great way to get your feet wet without having to make the, uh, the, the hard fixed investment in, in hardware or the soft investment in people. We're, we're making a lot of progress actually on, on the interface front. Uh, this is an example out of OSC with their weld predictor portal. This is great stuff, right? So the idea for most of you guys know about the Blue Collar um, Supercomputing Initiative. There are a lot of other initiatives around the country. I just happened to pick this one um, as one of the first images that came up in the Google search. But the idea here is you use a computational environment to figure out what kind of welds you need and whether it's going to meet this, the service specs that you're going to have for the, the completed part, right? So this is like computing on the concrete floor in the shop by the guy who needs to do the weld. This is good stuff. Highly specialized. These interfaces tend to be really specialized toward an individual community or, or even individual pod of users in a specific part of a specific workflow. So there's a lot that, that can go into these kinds of things, which is why you see some focus on developing general purpose infrastructures, the, the two by fours, that we could just mass produce and then you can have tiger teams come in and, and rapidly assemble them into a structure. Uh, and that work needs to continue. But we're making some progress on the interface front. So the tool chain. Uh, the solution to this today, and I, I think probably for the foreseeable future, is just gonna be hand-to-hand -hand combat. Right, you're going to have to engage with a specific work group, figure out what their problem is, and, and this is non-trivial, right? Uh, in the case of some of the work that Dr. Post has done, uh, you know, they spent a year figuring out what we could do today, what we needed to do tomorrow, and how you could get a computer to help with that, right? So I don't want to trivialize this at all. Uh, in some respects, it is the most difficult part of the process because you've got to go in group by group, community by community, and beat this problem. Um, but the path for getting there is sort of obvious. Just not easy. The last one, though, I don't think we're paying a lot of attention to, and it could probably use a little bit more sunlight. So a little expertise and no social support. The problem is, I don't know how, and there's no one around here I can ask. Right? So this is a skills problem at its heart. And if you start to think about it, what you really want are two kinds of people. You want a lot of people, I would argue almost everybody, 
but that's probably a little too optimistic. You want a lot of people who are at least computationally literate. Okay. So these are folks that use high-performance computers, maybe. Maybe they just know kind of what they are and where they apply. They're generally familiar. They can run applications and to some first order approximation they understand computing principles, what it means to use a computer to solve a problem. And that means, that means understanding the limits of computers to solve problems and knowing that the answer that you get out of a complex simulation that looks about right is the most dangerous answer that you can have. Right? And then we need a smaller class of people, but pretty important group of folks and, and, and a group that needs to be much larger than it is today of computational professionals. Right? So these are, these are folks who, for example, might run and design high performance computers, right? write or extend applications that the, the folks on the left are going to run to solve their problems. Right? These are people who have mastered the principles of computing. Now these aren't all supercomputing folks. They, they aren't all people that work in our centers. Right? In fact, I'd say that needs to be maybe 40% of that class needs to work in a supercomputing center somewhere. Maybe less. The, the balance of those folks, most of those people, need to be out. They need to be out in the aircraft development community, in the washing machine development community, in the golf ball development community. Right? They need to be people who know about uh, the importance of the depth of a dimple on a golf ball and the importance of the shape of the dimple and where it is, right, and why the ball is white and why we play golf to begin with, um, so that they can put the, the tools and the techniques and the, the potential of high performance computing to work in a deep way in their community, right? That's where most of those people need to be. They don't need to be in supercomputing centers because that, having them in our centers is not. Uh, they need to be at least there, but they don't need to be only there. And having them in our centers is not scalable. Right? We can't possibly afford to employ enough people right, to write the applications and to enable the workflows and to apply supercomputing in all the places that it could be meaningfully applied uh, if everybody were to, to simultaneously look up and say, oh, hey, yeah, the sun really is good. We really do need this supercomputing stuff. Right? If the line got really long, we need to have the expertise out there in the community pulling it rather than inside our centers pushing it. We'll talk a little bit more about these folks. One of the keys is to get people, a lot of people, out in individual communities of practice where computation is relevant, right, which is many but not all, many but not all communities of useful work uh, can use computation. Uh, and we forget that too sometimes. Um, we need to have people out there who know how computing can be useful and when it might be usefully applied. So that when they're at a meeting or when they're at lunch or at a conference somewhere and somebody says, hey, you know, I really am having, I'm struggling with this, they can say, oh, well, maybe we can find an application that can help you solve that problem, right? That's really key. Knowing when, seeing an opportunity to apply computation, knowing that a computer might be able to help you solve a particular problem is, is a big part of helping our technologies be adopted um, in the real world by a lot more people than use them today. Right. A computation illiterate person generally understands the limits of computing. Right. And here, when you, when you talk about applying modeling and simulation, for example, in manufacturing or in uh, platform design, aircraft design, uh, car design, seat belt design, Right. It's really important that you have a, a very good idea that your code is giving you good answers, and so that means validation and verification. Right? Testing your code against real-world experimental results if they're available. Well, because we all have limited time and limited money, you can't completely validate, validate and verify your code. So you can only trust your code when it's doing things that you compared it to the real answer for and they were reasonably close. Sometimes you can trust your code when you're, when you're in the neighborhood of a problem that you measured its performance for, right? And if you get really far away, which we want to do sometimes in supercomputing, right? Sometimes we, we want to start with some known principles and then get really far away from those principles to do something that absolutely can't be done any other way. Colliding galaxies is a good example. Hard to ver verify and validate that code beyond validating the core principles that make it all go. But when you get really far away, you need to carry the knowledge with you that you're really far away, right? And take your results with a grain of salt. 
That's all part of computational literacy. Um, if you're, you know, my, uh, so I'm an undergraduate, was in electrical engineering, and the professors at the beginning of the semester, of course they had grown up without all the fancy calculators that we had when we were in school. Uh, and so they always accused us of being plug and chuggers. Right, working the formula, a number comes out, you write it down, and you go on to the next problem on the test. And so the example you know, would always be of the kid who uh, was solving a circuit and came up with the need for an, an infinitely resistive, resistant resistor, and that would make the current flow in the circuit. Right? Well, that's just plugging and chugging. You make an error along the way. You don't think about what it is you're doing, and you write it down. Right? The temptation to do what the computer tells you is really significant. Uh, and a computationally literate person would be aware of that temptation and be able to compensate for it. So this kind of person is going to have a general understanding of computing. Right. Better than my mom, with all respect to my mom, uh, but probably not at the level of the people in this room. So she's going to know what hardware is, what software is, right? and the relationship between hardware and software. There's a remarkable number of people who don't know what an application is. And these are all people with iPhones and Android phones and desktops, and they all run Word, and they all run Excel, and they all check their email, and they all run dozens of applications each and every single day, but they don't know that that's what they're doing. Right? They just double-click the icon. And if you're, if you're talking about a population who is uh, accustomed to individual computing, to a resource that's very personal to them and integrated with their fingertips to their being, right? They may not know what the relationship is between hardware and software, that there is such a thing as an application, uh, that you might ever need to write one, right? let alone compile it. What's a compiler? Right. And then they need to know a little bit about, a little bit about the special case of parallel computing. Right? Not a lot, but a little, mostly from the perspective of understanding that sometimes when you put more processors on a problem, you get the answer faster. Not always, sometimes. The computationally literate person may know how to run a small set, may know how to run a small set of specific applications to solve a problem, right? If he doesn't know how to run the application, he'll probably know where to go for help if he needs it, right? The point here is we don't just need the literate people to be the people running the applications. We need them also in sort of the low and mid-level management, right? The, um, the captains and lieutenant if, lieutenants, if you talk about the Department of Defense. People out there who are actually doing work and experiencing a problem and able to recognize an opportunity for computing to fill a void. Right? And the point of stressing the, the nuances here is to say that if you're going to embark on a program to develop a computational literate workforce in the country, right, it's got to have a pretty big filter. There are a lot of people who should know a little bit and don't today. So computational professionals, that's most of us. If you're in this room at this conference, you're probably a computational professional. Mike Bernhardt excluded. Uh, many people who are computational professionals specialize along hardware software dimensions. Not all of us, but some of you only design hardware. You build supercomputers or you build the networks that feed them, right? But some of you only write software, but there's room in the middle for both. <laughs> and then the other significant difference here is there's a deep understanding of the design, the operations, and the maintenance of either hardware or software. If you have a deep understanding, it's probably not both. So I talk here about the skills to architect and the skills to operate, right? So those are your people that, that design, write applications, and those are your people that run the machines. Keep it all going. And, if you, and the reason I make the distinction is, again, if you're thinking about how do you educate a cadre of computational professionals, you can't only focus on the people who do the architecture who, or who write the software, right? If you're thinking about establishing career paths, building an environment uh, that can both uh, attract new talent and in which we, as the people who run organizations, can develop that talent and offer people a career path, right? Then you need to be worried about the people who, who run and maintain these systems as well. Um, not all of the top, even the top 500 is this way, but when you get above about number 200 in the top 500, uh, it's a pretty safe bet if you're installing a machine in that category, it's a one-off for some reason. It's either a one-off because of the particular dot rev you have of Luster or the particular dot rev you have of 
of uh, Linux or you're using a license manager that hasn't been used with with 2,500 cores before on this rev of hardware from Intel with that BIOS, right? All of those issues, once you get up above something you can, you can order on the web and have drop shipped to you overnight, all of those issues come around to bite you and make running a supercomputer a research activity to some extent. It's at least a development activity. Right? And then certainly when you get above number 50, you're, you're on your own. And for those of you in the room that sell those computers, you know that if, if you're selling a, a 10 or $20 million system to somebody, then you're going to be engaged. You're going to have really smart people in your shops engaged with your customer for six to eight months while you shake out all the bugs that weren't supposed to be there and where you deal with all of the things you changed that, that shouldn't have affected anything right? when you were doing the design for this particular system. And all of those go into building the computational professional. So this, this, is not a, this is not a great slide. I need to do better over time as I spend more time thinking about it. But I, I did want to get it up there to make it a little bit more concrete. So I picked two areas, manufacturing and defense acquisition. And, and I put, so this is my continuum, right, for, for where you fall on the computational spectrum. And I start with irrelevance. There really is no kidding a bunch of people out there that don't need to know this stuff. It would probably be helpful if they did. It would, certainly wouldn't hurt. Right? No one would, would go to their grave wishing that they hadn't taken that training class in high performance computing. But, but they don't need it to get their job done. They're perfectly happy and completely successful in accomplishing their part of, their, of the mission if they don't know anything about it. And so my dad, uh, for example, was an aircraft avionics technician at, when I, the whole time I was growing up. He, he went in and fixed the radars and the instruments, and if your altimeter wasn't working, he was the guy that went in and fixed that, right? His job at that time, he wasn't ever going to be the kind of guy that needed to run a, a high-performance computing application. Totally fine. Right? And we need to be prepared to acknowledge that. Um, in, in manufacturing, this might be a technician on a, on a shop floor. So when you get to the point that you start thinking about who needs to be literate in that environment, well, certainly your process managers need to be, right? Because those are going to be the kind of people that are going to know when a problem occurs or know when there's, there's a continuing problem that's, that's creating either a quality issue or a service life issue or something, right? They're going to have direct exposure to that from above and the ability to reach out with their hands and touch the process that can solve the problem below them. Right? And so getting people at that level that understand when and where computation can be meaningfully applied is important if you're, if you're concerned about, as I think we should be, having more people adopt supercomputing. Right? And then who would be, in this environment, who would be your computation professional? This is your specialist team, the folks that care and feed the applications. Maybe they extend the applications to support a new kind of steel they have in the shop. Um, these are people more like the folks we have in our centers. right? So on the defense acquisition side, and I picked on defense acquisition because I'm a Department of Defense employee, and Doug talks about it all the time, whether I listen to him or not. So on the irrelevant side, there are people who run the process. Right? So support process personnel not going to be impacted by the tools that we put together. Right? Uh, on the literacy side, in the middle, your systems engineer, the guys, and there are order 10 to 5 of these guys right, who are out in industry and in the Department of Defense, make, you know, trying to make the decision about the thickness of the aluminum on the body, or what kind of armor plating do I need to use, or how fat do the tires need to be, or how far do my ailerons need to articulate, right? These guys absolutely need to know about and, and run applications, physics-based uh, science and engineering applications that can help them make better decisions, right? This group of folks, really needs to run not five or six simulations to decide if the design that they kind of thought would work when they came into this was a good idea, but they need to run 10,000 or 100,000 simulations so that they can experiment with the designs that are crazy. And there's no way that those things should work, but let's run them through the computer and see what happens. And once every five years, one of them is the next stealth bomber, right? And that's how that kind of serendipitous, that's how we can help enable that kind of serendipitous discovery by making our tools more ubiquitously available. Right. And then who's the computational professional in that particular uh, workflow? The research, development, and test, and evaluation community. The people that write the codes right. and deploy, build, architect, and run the machines. 
So how do we get there? So it certainly needs to start at the very bottom with minimum literacy about computers everywhere. Right? The whole population needs this. So, and, and here I'm not talking about the kinds of things that we do, but I'm talking about the basics of what a computer is and what it can do and what's an application and that there is an application and that computers don't think in English, right? They think in ones and zeros, and by the way, they don't really think at all, right? And these are concepts that, if if they're understood, they're implicitly understood, and increasingly, that's not a good thing. Computer science and computing technologies drive uh, our culture, at least in the West, and they need to be understood at some minimum level. Well, this is the mission of organizations like Computing in the Core. Right? There are already folks out there who are advocating to get. Um, primary education curricula changed so that it, it includes and will count towards graduation the kinds of things that kids can do in middle school and high school to get a basic understanding of what a computer is, right? Um, these activities are a fantastic idea and they are the foundation if you look at putting us on a vector for success over the next 20 years, I think it is a 20 year vector, right? The activities like this are the foundation that, we have, that we're going to build on. So our community needs to be advocating for things like this. So, so when you get back to your rooms tonight, Google computing in the core and take a look and see if you think it's a good idea. And if you don't, Google something else until you find something you do think is a good idea and figure out how you can support it. All right. And then we're going to have a path that diverges. Right? On the computational literacy side, you're going to need to have just in time kinds of training and short term certification programs, right? This isn't about undergraduate and graduate curricula on, on this side, or isn't only about that, right? There is a role, and I, I credit my friend Bill Feyerizen for this idea, or for bringing this idea to me, um, there is a role, and a meaningful role, for certification programs, certificate programs. Why just in time, right? Because it needs to be available when and where people need it, right? You bring a new guy in, um, you want him to have the basics of computational literacy. He's not been through the program before. He spends a couple of days in front of a web browser and gets some moderately engaging content, the best we can do. Um, it doesn't have to be awesome. You just have to be able to get through it. Uh, and comes out on the other side knowing more than he knew when he went in, right? And if you think about scale, if you think about wanting to have tens of millions of people using these tools, then it can't all be about flying somewhere and taking a class, okay? Associates programs have a role to play here, and even if you think very big, right, and if you think about a very mature effort to develop these kinds of concepts, then you're talking about community colleges too. Right? That's a great place to get this kind of stuff in at a level above what computing in the core is going to bring into the high schools when it is successful. Okay. And so then on the, on the computational professional side, we're doing a little bit uh, better job there just because we're all here and we all did something. Um, in college to get here. I was fortunate, I was at Mississippi State University back in the early 90s when the idea of a computational engineering degree was just starting to take hold. So I was in one of the first actual official programs that is, is something that looks like a supercomputing graduate program, right? There still aren't a lot of those today. Most of the people that I work with are chemical engineers or mechanical engineers or electrical engineers. People who, in order to get or physicists uh, who seem to be able to do anything. Um, but people who needed to solve a real problem, right, recognize that computing was a tool that could get them there, right, were, were kind of good at it, became a local resource for their colleagues, and decided that they wanted to spend more of their time doing this. That's how you get to supercomputing, right? Well, that's, that's okay if, if, you, if you're running a hobby, right, and if you never want to really have the impact that we can have on the planet, I think that that model is, is perfectly acceptable. It's gotten us where we are today, which is a pretty good place, right? But if you, but it's not the best way, it's not the optimum way to do it. I think what you would like to do is to have a recognized profession with career paths and obvious entry points and handholds and a fairly good outreach program that would reach out and expose people to, to the really cool things that we do, right? And bring them in actively. Uh, provide the tools that organizations need to develop career paths for their employees so that it could be, um, well, I think supercomputing is cool and, 
and I'm not sure what my future looks like, but I'm going to go do it and let's see what happens, right? But rather, Superunity is interesting, it's relevant, and I know what my career is going to be going forward. And that's going to be a big part of getting the really smart people to come and stay rather than heading off to Wall Street to sell questionable products of a financial nature. Um, okay. Certification, um, I have it on both sides. I have it on the professional side and on, on the literacy side. It's got a role to play in, in, in both spots because if you have somebody who's a lifelong chemical engineer who needs to apply our tools but stay in chemical engineering, right, then that's a way to give him the knowledge that he needs. Uh, when I was in grad school, we taught week-long um, professional education courses on grid generation, right? The latest and greatest tools coming out of the universities to generate grids. People from all kinds of industries would come in, learn about the work that we were doing, spend a week, and then go back, able to generate their own grids on their own geometries, right? So that kind of, of professional, almost in time, uh, education at a certification level also applies um, over there. Okay, so I think this is my last slide. How do we get there? This slide is pretty empty because we need to do a lot more thinking as a community. But the first thing that we need to do is, is figure out what skills matter for the literate person, what skills matter for the professional person. And the education community knows a lot about this because this is what they do, right? So super the, super, the annual supercomputing conference is a great opportunity for us to engage with the education community, right? and have them guide us in figuring it out what it is that people in our business need to know and when they need to know it and, and how we can teach it to them, right? We'll do this for high performance and supercomputing, right? But over time, it's also going to need to be tailored for specific application domains, chemical engineering, aircraft design, uh, industrial process design, because above a baseline foundation, right, there are little curly cues for each domain. And those curly cues will need to be uh, identified and planned out. We may have an opportunity to help build career paths by identifying skill levels. So someone who starts as an amateur proceeds to be uh, a novice and then works his way up to a master, for example, in whatever particular set of skills uh, he or she is, uh, does for a living. Right? And this would be good for, for individuals. It would also be good for recruitment. So as, as somebody who, who needs to hire supercomputing people, I'd love to be able to ask for a master scientific application developer right? and have that be a thing. And I would know sort of to some first approximation what skills I was getting when I hired that person. And the people that wanted to come into this profession could say, okay, well, if I, if I go out and complete this course of training, then someone will have some confidence that I can do this. And it gives me, me as an employee a way to get into the career field. If you're out talking to high school students or young undergraduate students, right, that can be the difference between them coming to do this and them going off to do whatever else it is that people do when they don't do supercomputing, which just really seems short-sighted to me. But I'm told that there are other rewarding things that you can do. Uh, and one way to get this done would be to structure certification programs and to partner with some of the professional societies um, in getting this out. And part of the reason is they already do this. They're easy handholds for, for Engineers, scientists, physicists um, don't have to do it this way, don't have to have a formal certification process at all, but it's one way that we could go. And so that apparently was my last slide. Um, if you have any questions, I'll take those. Maybe more germane if you have feedback. You think this is a bad idea? You think it's a good idea? You think it's already been done? I'd love to hear that as well. This is something that we're talking about within the Department of Defense because we're in the process of investing a significant amount of money to develop applications in that sort of that hand-to-hand -hand combat slide, right, that will bring supercomputing tools to a wider community within the department. I'm also part of um, the NIDRD subcommittee, right, and those folks who worry about high-end computing are also talking about this. And then there's a variety of professional organizations, for example, ACM, SIG HPC, which I encourage you to look into if you're not already members, right, they're talking about this. So there are a lot of people in the community who are talking about the need to do this. And so if you have experience, we need to know about it.